Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, Osmosism Tester, but specifically uh, some uh, work I've been doing, doing lately about adding uh, GPRS support uh, to it. So quick recap, Osmosism Tester, um, it's some software written in Python, which actually uh, uh, is in charge of uh, doing end-to-end -end to, uh, testing um, with real hardware. So uh, it just starts the whole network every time, and then uh, we write Python tests, uh, which do whatever we want, and then we get some results from there. Um, yeah, and the idea is to test the different hardware. So um, yeah, which which kind of stuff did, did we want to t to test actually? So um, uh, regarding GPRS, uh, we have that uh, several KPIs uh, we want to. Uh, have a look at like yeah latency throughput. Uh, actually, check if uh, there's some fair queuing uh, between MS at the same time. Um, then also uh, different scenarios uh, we want to test, which are uh, yeah I mean uh, they are usual in uh, in uh, real life, and actually we get some uh, reports that some of them don't work sometimes in real networks. Um, so uh, we had this issue, for instance, in which. We've been told that uh, if a user is not sending data, then after a while, then it won't be able to receive uh, packets from the coming from the network. Uh, so uh, this uh, this kind of setup actually helps us, uh, yeah, test these kind of behaviors with real hardware. Um, some other interesting stuff about uh, this project is being able to test some specific hardware, like for instance, Nano BTS. So uh, we support a dynamic PDCH channel there. So uh, switching from PDCH to uh, yeah TCH channels, for instance, and that actually uh, allows us to check if uh, we had any regression with uh, any change. Um, but yeah, actually, uh, this kind of testing involves lots of different projects like Cosmo BTS, Cosmo PCU, whatever. Uh, so lots of stuff involved. So um, as we said, Osmosism Tester which is on top, it's orchestrating all the processes. Uh, I'll go later about that NetNS stuff, that box, um, but uh, you can basically see Osmosis and Tester controlling all different processes, so uh, from left to right, let's say, MS side to more like core network side on the other end. Um, first of all, um, yeah, we have a client application. In this case, uh, for instance, we just run iperf, so we just want to send some data and see actually if it goes and uh, like, yeah, what's the throughput we get. Um, then uh, we use a phono actually to driving the modems, um, which uh, then will end up sending something over the air. In this case, in Osmosism Tester, we are actually wiring everything up. Um, and uh, yeah, well, it will go through the core network uh, and eventually we'll reach out uh, the GCSN, which will uh, output some IP data, which will end up in a uh, server and back. So um, you may notice I added there in the middle of Ophono and modem UDEF uh, in this case. Uh, so I'm going to explain later lots of issues we had and uh, how UDEF is related to those. We'll see later. Um, so, um, yeah, going back here. Uh, so actually all this is running in uh, in the uh, same uh, host. So everything's running on the same uh, network setup, let's say inside the same host. Uh, that uh, actually provides us with some issues. So basically uh, when we want to test one specific modem because we want to test like what we said, uh, this path, uh, if you have everything on the same host, uh, actually then it's just going to be routed to a loopback, right? I mean, see, if you have uh, iperf client process and iperf server running on, on the same host, it's basically going just to loopback. Um, and of course, that's not what we want because we want it to uh, be sent over uh, the modem. Um, so um, what's the problem there? Uh, we, if, if we want to set up rout routing accordingly uh, to route traffic through the modem interface, uh, it happens that actually we end up in some kind of uh, routing loopback because uh, you've tried to fit all data into the modem interface and then it gets out of GGSN, but then if you route it uh, again, it basically will try to, to route and then the packets will drop. So it, it, yeah, it was not working at all. Of course, you can fix that by using some IP tables uh, um, magic, like uh, FW mark, marking packets, and then deciding on whether uh, 
for, uh, yeah, FDW mark is mark, or so, so you can make some tricks, but uh, the problem with that is that actually, um, that's a bit, uh, yeah, it's not good to do that in case that we are actually um, changing uh, network dynamically, which is what we are doing in Osmosis and Tester, like we are bringing networks up, we are bringing networks down, so uh, it's not really uh, fit for here. Like this kind of uh, complex configuration, it's nice if you have just one host, actually with some static or mostly static set, uh, network configuration, and you are done with it. So um, the obvious solution, well, obvious after testing or thinking about it uh, for a while, uh, was actually to have uh, different net, net namespaces in the same host, um, and then actually move one modem interface, uh, network interface, to each network, name, net, network namespace, uh, and then just add default routing through that network interface. So. Uh, let's say you have three modems, then you create three network namespaces, you move the uh, network interface announced by the, by the modem, so when you connect it as a USB, then you get a network interface assigned to that modem, uh, you move that to uh, the network namespace, then in that network namespace you configure the routing to send all default uh, traffic through that interface. And then at, uh, it, will, it will be sent we go back here, so it will be sent over there. Routing will, will actually, when you run hyperfly inside the NetNS, it will uh, take the default route, then it will go through there, and then it will end up in Osmo GGSN, which will output in the default network namespace, and uh, then it will actually be able to route uh, without having a loop there, because the routing in the default network namespace is different than this one. Um, so, that's how the routing is uh, set up. So that's the conclusion we arrived here. Um, so yeah, we decided we want one network namespace for, per modem. So now the objective is actually to um, yeah find a unique uh, net namespace for each modem, because actually on top we want Osmo GSM tester to be able to um, infer the uh, the network namespace for each modem because like I'm Osmogism tester, I'm uh, managing modems, so I'm gonna use this modem. But okay, now I need to know which network namespace I need to use for that modem to run the tests because, as we said, we are moving one uh, yeah the E phase to one net net network namespace. Um, so how, how we do it? How how we do it? Um, uh, in Osmo GSM Tester, we identify modems actually by its uh, system uh, path. So it's, uh, it's def uh, path from udef or system path from uh, slice sys. Um, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Uh, basically because Ophono doesn't provide with uh, persistent unique names of modems. So basically if you list your, uh, your modems in Ophono, um, the modem names actually can change over time. So the same physical modem can actually, if for instance, if it, if it goes down and it goes up, it, or it crashes, and so it's re-registered, uh, the name uh, showed by your phone will change. So the only way to actually identify a modem is by using the system path uh, uh, property that also Phono brings us, actually because we send a patch to add that, yeah. Maybe to illustrate that it's uh, similar to, let's say, persistent uh, or non-persistent uh, TTY USB names, right? You unplug and replug your serial converter and they get different names and uh, it's the same issue. Yep, indeed. I mean, we'll see it later, it's the typical, uh, it's the same issue we have with uh, network interfaces, right? That's why supposedly uh, systems move to have a persistent naming of uh, Ethernet uh, interfaces, so instead of F0, F1, uh, we moved We'll go there, uh, we'll see that that also has some limitations. Um, so yeah, coming back here. So we have uh, one unique syspath per modem, and uh, uh, that means that uh, since that, that's unique, we can infer a network namespace for that. So uh, actually the way that uh, Linux makes up the paths, if you see as you go to the right, the uh, directory names become larger, that's because actually the directory name actually contains the, the whole path, so that's like hubs in the middle or whatever, so it's like, it's a tree, so last directory actually contains kind of the whole tree, so that should be kind of enough to uh, identify um, where is a device located. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, then uh, actually you see the net device in this case is WW10. Uh, so we decide that the net or namespace that we are going to use for this uh, interface is going to be uh, that 1536, which is actually just its position uh, according to USB 3, let's say. Um, so yeah, reach that point. Um, we know uh, the interface of a modem, and then we know the net, net network namespace name that we are going to use for that modem to run the tests. Um, now I'm going to enter into some internals of a phono, UDEF, and network namespaces to uh, show you some issues that we can run into. Um, so first of all, Ophono. As I said, Ophono uses UDEF basically to uh, find modems. Uh, so. Ophono starts up and says, OK, uh, where are the modems? It just starts checking on UDEF, uh, it uses UDEF Monitor API to do that. Uh, and then it has kind of its own database inside, just in code. And then it checks like what, what it finds there. And then it does some matches. And uh, then from there, it infers, oh, this is a modem. I will create some objects for that. Um, and uh, yeah, at the same time, it also takes uh, this uh, device from UDEF, and then it finds that, oh, it's, uh, it has a sub-device of a uh, uh, type network or net. And then it infers, OK, this is the network interface of this modem. So it kind of builds its own uh, uh, object, right? Um, uh, something important, too, which we notice is, uh, so Ophono, as we said, it has this modem object, and then it infers it has this network object, which is attached to this modem. Um, through UDEF code, if Ophono detects that this network device uh, is dropped, we'll see later why it can happen. So it disappears from, from the kernel, so this net interface is, is gone. Then it will decide to actually drop the entire modem. Okay? So uh, that means that you cannot use that modem anymore. Um, then let's go about uh, yeah let's go talk about UDEF a bit. Um, UDEF uh, runs in the default network namespace. Um, that means that actually only sees and manages network interfaces or devices devices in general which are on the default network namespace. Um, what does that mean? So um, so for those who don't know, the default network namespace is the usual one you use, basically, if you don't move anything to another network namespace. So if you don't know about network namespaces, you are using the default network namespace. Um, UDEF also does that. Um, so UDEF actually talks with the kernel through a Netlink socket. And from there, it receives notifications on the status of uh, yeah, the devices, right? Uh, so what happens when you move a network interface from the default network namespace to another network namespace? Uh, well, the uh, kernel decides that, uh, uh, let's say, all processes on the default net running under the default network namespace should no longer be able to use or know about this network namespace. So uh, it tells UDEF that this uh, network interface is removed, okay? And then if you m take this network interface, which is in another network namespace, and you move it back to the default network namespace, um, UDEF will actually see that it's, uh, it appears again. So actually, you can, you can trace that with UDEF admin or whatever. So you will see a remove event and an add event. Um, we ask about this behavior in uh, the GitHub issue you see here in systemd. And uh, well, um, yeah, Leonard Potter uh, answered that, yeah, it's known uh, behavior. Uh, it's kernel limitation, let's say, so system, uh, system the UDEF runs in the default network namespace, and we cannot do anything about that. So that's how it works. Um, yeah, so what, what's the conclusion about, about these uh, two programs? Uh, if we move a network interface to another network uh, namespace, which is not the default one, uh, UDEF uh, will, will send a remove event to its clients, and that means that the phono will, will receive a remove event for that network interface, and that means that a phono will drop the modem uh, out, so you cannot reach it anymore. Uh, and that's not we want, what we want, of course, because we, we want to use different modem net, uh, different network no namespaces, but still we want to be able to use it through a phono. So what what we need to do, we patch a phono to actually avoid this kind of behavior. So uh, we have uh, a phono patch in our uh, uh, Osmo GSM tester branch, 
uh, which actually prevents Ophono from removing uh, modems if the network uh, modem is removed, if the network interface is removed, sorry. Okay, that's some of the limitations. Let's go now to see an example on how a test uh, using GPRS in Osmo GSM tester looks like. Um, like all tests, basically the first block is common to all tests. We import modules, we start the whole network, so we get the objects, we start BDS start, SGSN start, whatever start. Um, then we have the um, MS object, which is actually a modem, which underneath uses a phono. Uh, and we tell the HLR to add the subscriber data from this MS. Then uh, we tell the MS to connect to the MSC. Uh, that's actually an asynchronous uh, function, so it, it just starts the, co the registering. Then we also tell the MS that it is allowed to attach uh, in GPRS to this network. That's also asynchronous. And then in the test, uh, we basically wait for the M MS to be connected to the MSC, so to be registered, and to be attached to GPRS. Um, so once we are here, we have an, uh, an, uh, yeah, an MS which is connected to the MSC, and actually GPRS is attached. Uh, at that point, uh, we want to activate a PDP context. So um, yeah, we just tell the, the MS which APN do we want to connect to, and uh, the protocol we want to use, IPv4, IPv6, uh, whatever. And uh, next function is setup context data plane. Uh, we'll see later what this function does uh, internally. Um, and one, once that context data plane, so basically just summary, this, this function does all these uh, network namespace movements and setups and whatever. And uh, then we simply run a ping command in this, ca in this case. So the, the first case I show it was using iperf. In here I'm just pinging uh, the uh, GGSN address. Um, and if it fails, then basically the test is gonna fail. Um, and then finally I deactivate the context. So that's how the test looks like. And now we're gonna see some internals of this test. Uh, first of all, that's what Ophono does behind uh, the Osmo GSM tester API. Um, so just for you to understand, green stuff in variables, it's uh, Divas paths. So you have a Divas path for each modem. And then you'll see context Y, that's an, uh, another path, uh, which is created, it's a context, it's a PDP context for each modem. So first of all, what do, I mean, that, that's, that's useful in case you want to do it manually with a phono. Um, so first of all, um, each modem has an interface called Connection Manager, uh, from which you can operate GPRS related stuff. Uh, so you can see example of get properties, so you have uh, some information like uh, right now it's not attached, uh, Beer actually is not implemented with QMI. Uh, there's a ticket about that. Uh, whether we are allowed roaming, powered, whatever. Um, so what do we want to do in this case? So uh, we power it on and we allow roaming in case uh, we don't use the same uh, uh, MCC, M yeah, whatever. Um, then we wait for a phone to tell us that actually we are attached. Um, uh, yeah, because attach is only a read-only property, so we power it on, then it should attach at some point. Um, then we add a PDP context, and it will return the Dbus path, so we can set it up. Um, now on this context, we actually set it up like access point name, username, password, protocol, etc. Um, finally, we activate it, and once it, it's activate, uh, we can get some properties about it, and that's what the kind of properties we get from a phono once, once we are established. Uh, so some interesting stuff. Uh, you get the DNS uh, values which are set on Osmo GGSN. Uh, we are still not uh, checking those values are correct in Osmo GSM tester, uh, but it's, uh, it's quite straightforward. It's just about adding some functions. Um, actually, we fixed uh, back in Ophono uh, a few weeks ago, because basically the first one was duplicated. Actually, this this probably is the case, and I'm running an old version of Ophono here. Um, uh, something also really important for us, uh, Ophono provides us with the interface name here, uh, from, for, uh, assigned to that modem. Uh, and 
Actually, in here it says method static. I think, well, Linksys will know better, but uh, that means you can configure modems uh, in two ways, like uh, dynamic, which is using DHCP, and actually that's what we are using, and static is you need to set up the address, uh, I think. Oh, uh, by the way, I think addressing here is actually the address that uh, is assigned to you by GGSN. Um, so, if you remember the test, I was talking about uh, explaining you later the setup context data plane uh, function. Um, so, that's what basically it does. Uh, as I said, uh, we have to move. So, if, if, if at this point we know the interface name uh, from that modem, so we know which interface do we have to move to our network namespace. Uh, I also explained already how to get the name of the network namespace we want to use. Um, so we have all the data there. So we just move it. Uh, I'll explain you later how uh, we do that. Uh, but just call this function, and it moves the uh, network interface to um, yeah the network namespace uh, we selected. And then we have to set up this new network namespace and the modem uh, e-face. So basically, we have to uh, bring up the network interface and run the HCP on it. Yeah, and uh, so why do we want actually to move the network namespace, the, the network interface to the network namespace every time? Uh, so originally we actually only had one Python script which just set up all network namespaces and moved all the interfaces there. But uh, that that would be perfectly fine if uh, the interfaces would always stay in that network namespace. But that's not the case because modems crash. Um, and basically, when a modem crash, uh, uh, well, um, when modem crash, then the kernel actually uh, drops the network interface, and then when the modem is back again, uh, the modem re-registers the network namespace. Um, but the kernel may decide to use a different uh, network interface name than the one that it used to use before. Um, so basically it will try to get, so th the way that the kernel assigns the network namespace, sorry, the network names, uh, is basically it looks for the first uh, counter available in the default network namespace, as far as I could understand from looking at uh, several traces. Um, and uh, yeah, that's dangerous because actually if uh, you may end up uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, in this scenario, you can even end up in the situation where you have two modems and then modem A has uh, WW10 and modem B has WW1 and you can end up actually at some point having uh, the two modems actually with uh, the two network uh, interface names swapped. So, and that's a bit dangerous because actually Ophono doesn't detect uh, this kind of stuff, especially because we added uh, this patch to avoid removing the devices. So it could happen that we were, since we are moving network, na network interfaces to network namespaces, it could happen that we were moving actually the wrong network interface because we still thought that that name was assigned to that modem, but it was swapped. So it was a bit of a mess. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into details of the series of events in case you want to look at it, but uh, it can happen. Um, so what's, what's the conclusion from all this mess? Um, Ofono should require catching uh, interface renaming at some point, so you can just issue a interface renaming uh, by calling IP link set uh, that way. Uh, of course, we don't do that, but I mean, in theory, in theory, it should support it in case somebody just wants to rename an interface for the modem, um, and they don't do it. Uh, and yeah, since all this naming stuff is a mess, let's just go sane and, and use persistent naming also for network interfaces. So we we are we are, don't end up having this kind of uh, na renaming mess. So um, we decided we want to have uh, persistent naming for interfaces we use. Um, so let's add some rules to UDEV to actually have persistent uh, uh, naming, right? Uh, 
so here's a sample of the rule we initially used uh, to do that. So uh, it will basically use this import built-in net ID. Uh, so this actually um, this fits into the uh, into UDEF some variables which you can use to set up uh, persistent naming. So as I said before. Uh, you ha nowadays we have this persistent naming of interfaces in Linux, like you have, uh, well, that like that one, WWP, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so this actually is calculated, let's say, or generated by, by, by this uh, net ID module, uh, and it's fit into that kind of variable, ID net name path. Um, so that looks fine, right? I mean, for the first case, we initially get a WW12 uh, interface by the kernel, and we just rename it to something persistent. Um, so in case you don't know, also the last lines of the new name, it's also based on the path, on the USB path. <laughs> well, it, it's persistent as long as you don't move the path, but it has some limitations, we'll see. Uh, in this case, for instance, you may see like the, th that that was real. So. After applying this rule, some of the interfaces were moved, so were, were renamed, but not, some others, they were not. Uh, so there's small difference between one syspath and the other one. One is a bit larger than the other one. Um, so what's the problem here? Um, so Linux defines uh, this uh, define, ifnamsys, which is uh, 16. And that's the maximum name an interface can have in Linux. Um, and what's the problem here? So as you start uh, stacking up stuff in USB, uh, your tree becomes larger, your path becomes larger, and eventually you cannot fit that into this uh, persistent naming scheme, right? So. If you count there, it's probably, I mean, I made it probably by hand, but it should be like 15, but then if you try to add a zero, like change that two by a 10, it's going to be 16. So the kernel basically, in this case, uh, when NetID is run, it detects the path is too large in UDEF, so it basically won't allow this, and ID net names path won't be fit, so it will be uh, empty, so that means that the rule is not applied. Uh, because yeah, system D UDF detects that the path is gonna be too uh, too long, so it's not gonna work. Um, so how do we fix it? Um, well, uh, we have other ways of let's create our own persistent naming scheme. Um, for those cases in which uh, ID net name path is not set by ID net, uh, let's do it our own way. So we take the dev path. Uh, so yeah, you remember how I, we got uh, persistent name, uh, persistent network namespace, uh, unique names. We just got the last part of the system ID, right? It's actually the same as in here. Just it just builds the path, right? But it's too long. Okay, so just let's hash that. That's the way I found out. I mean, uh, we take the. Um, Dear name of the dev path, so in this case it would be like one five four ten. We hash it. Um, I have to use dear name by the way because uh, the last uh, the last stuff on the path it's actually the interface name, which of course changes over if the modem crash because it, it increases. So that's not unique. So you need to take dear name, and um, yeah, you hash it and you take uh, fourteen uh, bytes, which is like yeah. Probably could be 15, but as you, yeah. Oh yeah, but there's an error there, so. Uh, so yeah, we end up with this kind of naming, but it's unique. It's a bit strange, but it's unique. So it doesn't change, and we are not affected by uh, these issues anymore. No collisions yet? No collisions yet, and if we have some, I guess we can just rearrange uh, <laughs> some USB paths to not get them. I mean, it's too, uh, like, too, yeah, elevated to 14, so I mean, we are not like running, I don't know, one million uh, uh, modems there, so it should be quite fine. And still, I mean, for some paths, we still use the other one, so it's still less, less possibilities, so. Um, yeah, okay, so up, up to here, um, everything looks fine, we are solved, but actually I still saw Sometimes some interfaces were not being renamed. 
Um, so debugging it a bit more. Yeah, and actually this renaming look a bit like random actually. So it was not happening always on the same interfaces, it was happening sometimes. Uh, so debugging it with UDEF admin test, um, uh, so with debug enabled, I could see that actually UDEF was sending some failure messages saying that the interface was actually busy. And looking up on the internet, uh, that means that actually, uh, so in order to change the name of an interface, it, it must be down. It cannot be up. So you have to turn it down before, um, before changing the name. But actually that was a bit strange because, I mean, the interface was just bring that, brought that by the, by, by the kernel. I mean, just the, the device was started. So I didn't understand how could it be that it was up if nobody was using it. But actually, it seems that somebody was using it uh, even before UDEF. So it's a known issue that DHCP CD, um, it's also using a Netlink socket against the socket, so uh, against the kernel. So it can happen that uh, DHCP CD gets notification before UDEF does about this interface, so it tries to use it, to use DHCP on it. That means it brings it up and it tries to use it. So it can happen that when UDEF tries to rename this interface, this interface is already up and being used by DHCP. So um, the, uh, yeah, the, the solution for that is actually to tell DHCP CD to not, uh, not use these kind of interfaces by adding this uh, configuration entry so uh, we say just don't handle interfaces starting with WW or R, which match our prefixes. By the way, if somebody wants to read more about the issue in there. Um, so up to here, uh, we have uh, persistent uh, interfaces and we are fixed with that. Some other stuff. Um, so, um, one limitation of network namespaces I could not solve in a clean way is basically you need root access to actually change network namespaces. So from one process to another, you must be root. Um, and Osmo GSM tester is run under Jenkins, which is not root. So and we said that we are creating network namespaces, we are forking, well, we are creating processes in other network namespaces, so we need to be root, right? So, okay, just a uh, quick answer for that is, okay, let's just add some pseudo wrappers. I know it's super ugly, don't hit me, please. Um, but yeah, it kind of works, right? So we have some uh, EDC pseudoers uh, lines there, which allow for Osmo GSM tester group, group to run some scripts, right? Like these Osmo GSM tester net and execs, which basically calls IP net and exec, uh, the network namespace and, uh, and the, the program we want to run. Uh, you, you may remember these two programs here. IP link set dev blah, 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 UDHCP, that's run on the network namespace to set it up. So that must be run under root. And I'm back here. Um, but then that actually made some other problems. So Osmo GSM tester, you can see the, the process tree there. Osmo GSM tester runs sudo, which then runs Osmo, so the script, and the script runs iperf, right? Because we are running that on a different network namespace. So you have a process which is not root, running something as root, uh, because sudo is suid, so that's root. That means that you, cannot, you can only kill that if you are root. So, we, have to, we had to add some code in Osmo GSM Tester to actually do pseudo kill in this case because otherwise we could not kill that process. Um, that was one of the issues. Uh, next issue was that actually while running tests we noticed that uh, these processes run under sudo for some reason were not being killed correctly even if we were using sudo kill. Um, and so reading a bit more on uh, sudo uh, documentation, it says that sudo prevents being killed by its children. So it's to prevent, I don't remember why exactly, but it's to prevent some kind of, uh, yeah, situation. Uh, but actually the documentation is wrong. Um, it's not that sudo prevents its children to kill it. It's actually, it prevents the whole process group to kill it. So that means that, um, um, that means that the parent itself, the parent process which forked 
to sudo is not allowed to kill it. No, sorry, no, I, I'm, I'm wrong here. It's not that you cannot kill it, it's that it will not forward the signals you send to it. So usually, if you send a, a, a signal to sudo, it will forward it to, you, to, the to the child, right? It created, but the documentation states that it's not gonna forward these signals for signals sent by the children it created. So that's to avoid, yeah, that, that's to avoid the children, the children to kill themselves by killing sudo, something like that. Um, yeah, but the, the problem here is that it's not only kind of children, it's it more like it extends to relatives, you know, and um, uh, yeah, documentation doesn't, doesn't state so, but actually the, the, the process which forks to sudo cannot have its own signals forwarded. So if you run something under sudo and, and then try to send some signal to sudo, it won't forward it. Uh, to its children. Actually, if you do that on the terminal, I think it works. I'm not sure, but not if, uh, if the process is just forked directly. Um, so in order to fix that, uh, we have to, uh, in Osmosis GSM Tester, when we uh, create, uh, when we call sudo process, we have to add this, uh, this flag here, which actually changes the uh, process group of the, of the sudo process, so we can kill it later. Um, so, that's the end of the drama so far. Uh, tests are quite stable GPRS wise nowadays. Of course, modems keep uh, crashing, but it's not like we can do a lot of stuff about that, but they just crash from time to time and we recover from that. So only a few tests fail from time to time due to that. And we still uh, have to contact uh, um, yeah, vendors or whatever to get some updates. Um, so related topics on the future. Uh, I'm almost done, by the way. Um, yeah, we need to add 3G uh, network support, which also implies a data plane there. Um, then some of the implementation stuff, which may be useful. Uh, I, I won't go into detail now, but Ophono in QMI, we cannot spe specify IPv4 v6 EUAs or IPv4 IPv6. It just gets whatever it wants and use whatever they want because it's not implemented correctly. Um, and so right now we are running iperf tests fine, but we are actually not checking the results. So I mean, we get, if you look at the logs, you see uh, uplink and downlink uh, throughput for each modem, but we are not checking those and comparing them with some thresholds or KPIs or whatever. So we need to do that and we need to find out what do we want exactly there. Um, and yeah, there's plenty more tasks in uh, Redmine. So, final remarks, that's my last, my last uh, slide. Um, what we found out, um, network namespaces and real hardware don't play well together, so that's a mess. I mean, m my intention, yeah, my, my feeling is that that's super nice when you're run running uh, virtual machines and whatever, but uh, software which is prepared to run with real hardware uh, doesn't play really well with that, um, like Ophono. Or you Um Yeah, as always, I, I think I copied uh, this line in all my Osmosism tester talks. Uh, controlling the modems correctly is hard. Stability issues, they crash all of them, all vendors, no matter which one. And yes, this if a name limitation of 16 byte really uh, sucks. And that's it. Did you try to investigate what actually makes the modem crash? <laughs> no, as you can see, I was busy enough trying to get this working, so... <laughs> okay. What do you mean with some something simpler? <laughs> well, uh, probably, I mean, Harold probably knows more about that, but uh, as far as I know, AT, uh, 
yeah, it's kind of a rainforest, you know, like you don't want to go there. Well, <laughs> uh, the problem is AT commands have many different dialects, and if you've ever tried to write a parser for any kind of modem AT commands, it's a nightmare um, because every modem or even firmware updates, then they speak slightly different dialects, and especially if you then want to deal with unsolicited results codes and so on. I mean, we don't want to only set up a data connection. If that was all we wanted, that would be nice, and you could, I mean, you could use, it's not simpler, but you could use Modem Manager, for example, but we want to do all these voice features features, right? And um, that's uh, what most part of Osmo GSM Tester is about, uh, also is to really register, unregister, issue your voice call, accept a call, um, you know, whatever, maybe put the call on hold in the future or send SMSs and so on. And if you want to do all that by hand using AT commands, uh, that's going to be a rather complex task uh, with all the, the things running asynchronous and processing unsolicited result codes. Uh, so it's also not uh, simpler in the end. Also interesting from QMI, from using QMI, we get some nice features we actually have in our branch of a phono, like we print all the QMI messages we get to standard out. So, I mean, we get quite a lot of logging. Actually, uh, we get, we run out of uh, um, journal CDL or journal D uh, buffer log for Ophono because we print so much information during uh, the 16 hours it runs, uh, the whole test that actually, uh, I think I tried uh, increasing the buffer of, of it, but I'm not sure if it's uh, actually uh, applied correctly yet. I have to check. So, Just out of curiosity, Ophono uses to talk to the modem AT commands? or there's it, it depends on the modem. So some modems, so when it, it runs through UDEF, it actually it finds which kind of modem it is, and then for each modem it has, uh, yeah, it decides like, no, I'm gonna use AT for this one, and then it has some specific configuration for that one, because of course, as we said, like each modem uses a slightly different AT commands, and uh, so there's lots of if else in AT. I, well, I see some patches about that, like really trying to, oh, it, this works for me, but that doesn't work for me, so it's kind of, uh, so at least with QMI, it's kind of, standardized interface though. Uh, some modems we saw that like Govi 2000, they implement older versions of QMI, then some stuff is not supported. So, yeah. Um. Um, how, how possible or difficult would it to run the whole OSO, Osmo GSM tester at home? Like. <laughs> Does it need to be within a Jenkins environment or anything like that? Or? Well, the virtual one, uh, you can you can run it in Docker. Uh, the other one, it's uh, it's a good question. I mean, it it depends on really if you want it or not. Um, like we have some debug uh, test, which is nice because it sets up everything, and then you can use a phone to do some tests. Uh, it's it's a bit, I mean, there's a lot of configuration involved, but once you have that and you copy the one from production, it's kind of feasible, let's say. The problem is that it's, thing, it's, it's thought to actually be on a static system, so of course if you, you change your modem to another place, then you'll change, you need to change the configuration because the configuration contains the system path of the modem. So, I mean, it can be done. Uh, Okay, the other thing I was just thinking there, I remember a few years ago looking at what you could do with uh, Android devices and from like a automated standpoint. If you looked at that at all, I seem to remember well, thinking that you should be able to uh, like do airplane mode toggles and... Well, I mean, you, you can do that because of Fono actually, so I think the guys from Yola, uh, they have their own fork of Ophono with lots of patches, and actually they support a backend for real, which as far as I know is kind of the backend that Android uses to control the modems. So that means they support lots of modems uh, that are actually Android, but of course you need to run some, probably some Linux-based operating system on those Android phones. But I mean, that, there are some phones which do that, and you don't need like fancy drivers, you just need the modem there to test stuff. 
of course, it would be possible to write some Android app or whatever, but um, if it already sucks uh, that the baseband processor crashes and you have to recover and wait and so on and so on, just imagine how often your phones will need to reboot during any kind of automated test setup and how many hours every day you're just waiting for entire Android phones to reboot completely or get stuck somewhere or whatever. So I'm not entirely optimistic that this would uh, increase the reliability or anything um, on, 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 that, on that regard. I mean, um, what many people don't know is uh, if you actually look under the hood uh, on many phones, the, like the baseband processor crashes several times a day and, you know, uh, it just reboots. Uh, so uh, I'm, not saying, I'm not expecting it to be any more stable or any more reliable than, than, than using modems. I mean, in, in our case, we, we also we, we had lots of phono crashes because we stress it quite a lot because we are really like, okay, now we pour it on, now we pour it off, and we do it really quickly because, and then some stuff is still ongoing. So, I mean, yeah, we reported several stuff because... Uh, So, uh, out of curiosity, why do you need DHCP CD in the first place? I thought you use U DHCP in the slides. Well, that's that's. I mean, uh, Osmo GSM tester is just running on a Debian uh, on a Debian computer, and it happened to have DHCP CD running. Actually, it only happened on the R and I don't know why. Uh, it was only running on the um, on the on the R&D setup, not on the prod setup. So that was even more messier because I had kind of it working, well, I I was seeing that kind of things in R&D but not in prod, and then the system paths also were longer in, uh, in prod, so when I had it working in R&D, then I started running it in, in prod and suddenly nothing worked, so uh, yeah. Um, one thing that I'd like to add about the setting up your own Osmo GSM tester, as far as I know, the setup of the actual, uh, like the, the software and all the stuff that you need, uh, there are Ansible yep. uh, playbooks for that. So it's only, in quotes, all the configuration files, which is complex in itself, but at least all the software installation and all that uh, is automatic. Um. Yep. So, oh yeah. How often uh, does the modem crash actually, and how do you deal with it within one run of the whole test suite? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Like the problem is, it was so. The problem until now is uh, before these fixes, when it crashed, then yeah, everything got into a messy state because then interfaces were not moved, so tests were failing because it was trying to send stuff through the interface, which was not correct. So it was really difficult to figure out. Uh, round na right now, stability is quite better in the sense that if it crashes, it will only crash for that test, so th that test will fail only and not the next ones. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have time to look into that because it's kind of stuff that I do daily because it takes like 16 hours to run or 18 hours, so I just look at it at the results every day, but anyway, I don't have time to like fix all the issues. Like there's some stability issues also still in nano BTS and uh, some stuff, but it's quite better now. I mean, if you look at the uh, the wave, uh, yeah. Uh, so just only one thing. Um, we support uh, the, uh, scenarios like, uh, yeah, like I'm in a call and then, uh, well, I'm, I'm using uh, data packets and then I get a call in the middle, so uh, it switches to the call. Uh, scenarios in which uh, we actually change uh, PDCH dynamically, uh, so we test all these kind of scenarios. So I mean, if at some point you want to test any of these scenarios or you want to add it, should be kind of easy. Um, yeah, and I mean easy because sometimes you think adding a small feature, but then everything crashes, and you spend like one month trying to fix stuff. And yeah, that's it. Uh, so far, the best one. Actually, we are using um, so we are using Sierra wireless modems for call, uh, so for voice related, uh, voice signaling related tests, and EC20 for GPRS ones because Sierra wireless was crashing more during GPRS tests. I checked, and uh, EC20. I think I had issues with them with audio. So. Well, with audio, with signaling of voice calls. So actually, Osmo GSM Tester allows you to select the kind of modems through uh, configuration for each test, and we do that. So we say, 
run with this BTS and this modem and or this modem type, and then it allocates it from the pool and whatever. So.